Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second presentation of the uh, Boris FX Virtual SIGGRAPH. My name is Brian Fox. Excited to be with everyone today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have an amazing, amazing presentation lined up by Jonathan Winbush today, who's going to show us his Unreal and After Effects workflow and how Sapphire plugins fit into that. Uh, but before we get started, I uh, definitely want to introduce to everyone uh, something I forgot to do at the last session, which is the Boris Effects Suite, which we launched um, this week. The Boris Effects Suite is a new product by Boris Effects. It is everything we make in one annual subscription, uh, Sapphire Multihost, Continual Multihost, Silhouette Standalone and Silhouette Paint Plugin, Mocha Pro Plugin, Mocha Pro Standalone, and the new Boris Effect Optics, um, all in one subscription. And that that is on sale for $9.95 as a SIGGRAPH special. So you can use the code SIG20 at the BorisFX.com store if you guys want to um, take advantage of this great deal for an even cheaper price. Regularly priced $12.95 $12 on sale for $9.95. And one lucky winner today will be winning a suite, uh, uh, sorry, a subscription to the Boris Effect suite. Uh, I'll mispronounce that all day long. Um, so one lucky winner will win. The way to enter to win is to go to Boris Effects Live and sign up. Uh, there is a little form there to enter to win. Uh, we will pick from um, basically today's presentation, everyone who's signed up in the next hour, and we'll um, award some lucky winner a subscription to the Boris Effects Suite. Um, let's talk about what else we're doing today. Um, coming up after Jonathan's presentation, we have Mary coming in at 3 o'clock East Coast time, 12 o'clock Pacific time, doing Mocha Pro for VFX. Um, following her at 4.30 East Coast and at 1.30 on the West Coast, we have Brendan O'Neill from Bonfire, who's showing how he uses Unreal and Flame together to finish commercials. Um, really cool presentation, definitely um, Join in for that one. And closing the day out at 6 o'clock on the East Coast and um, 3 o'clock on the West Coast. Pardon my typo uh, in the graphic. 3 o'clock on the West Coast. Uh, John Dickinson is going to show us a sneak peek at Particle Illusion 2021 with some new features like support for the AE 3D camera. So very exciting stuff coming up in the 6 o'clock hour. Okay, um, let's get started. I, my pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan Winbush. Hello, Jonathan. What up, what up? Winbush. Hey, I'm what's up? What's up? <laughs> He's Thank working. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, love it, love it, love it. Um, also joining us today, um, joining Jonathan and I for today's presentation is Mr. Ross Shane. Ross is Chief Product Officer for Mocha. Hey, Ross. Guys. Good to see you both. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining. You know, I think we met a couple of years ago when you got you were doing a lot of the VR 360 uh, graphics with the uh, Mixmaster mic, right? That was really yeah, cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and now you're doing some Unreal stuff, so I'm really excited to see your presentation. Uh, thank you, man. Yeah, just um, always tinkering around with the tech. They used to call me Donatello when I was young. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, turtles, nice, so. <laughs> nice. Very cool. So, Jonathan, I, I was curious if you wanted to, you know, share a little bit about yourself, you know, how you got into motion graphics and 3D. I know you've worked on some pretty cool projects in the past, probably before you did the Mixed Master Mic stuff. So, yeah, we'd love to just hear a little bit about, who, you know, your background uh, in, in visual effects and, and graphics. Yeah, so, of course, um, Jonathan Wimbush, for those that don't know me, I've been doing motion graphics professionally since around 2006. Make a long story short, I got an internship under Adam Sandler working at Happy Madison. So that's how I got my start. And I interned with him for six months doing a wide array of stuff from movie trailer graphics to designing Blu-ray menus when they first came out, DVD menus. I got to do um, main title opens for movies and television shows. And so that work in there gave me just like a wide array of different aspects of motion graphics that I didn't know existed before. So whenever I was ready to freelance all around Los Angeles, I had just like a portfolio full with like all types of different stuff. And so from there, I went to Warner Brothers, worked there for a couple of years in-house and then started up Wimbush Immersive working for myself maybe around six, seven years ago and just been moving forward from there. That's 
sounds great. Like, what was your first tool that you learned or, you know, what was the first tool you loved to, to work in? Yeah, so it had to be, I say, After Effects because I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for motion graphics and VFX. And at the time they were teaching us, you know, it's both uh, motion graphics and VFX. And that's what I got my bachelor's in. And so we had some classes in After Effects and other classes using combustion. And at the time it was just like, just trying to like go through the VFX workflow and work on the same shot for a really long time didn't really appeal to me. And I always seemed to get excited when I went to my broadcast class and worked in After Effects. And it was just like cool project after cool project. And just the way the After Effects worked with the timeline and everything, I felt directly at home. So I would say After Effects was probably like my very first program that really pulled me in. We're looking at some of your uh, your reel right now. Very cool work. So I noticed in your reel that you actually incorporate a lot of 3D kind of depth, even in the flat kind of uh, flat kind of graphics. So is that was it that sort of uh, what got you into Cinema 4D? Just kind of playing, you know, through the After Effects 3D world. Um, funny enough, the very first. Um because when I was in school, I learned 3D Max and like I just tinkered with it in school because it was a part of the curriculum. But once I started working in the field, like my very first movie title I worked on was um, was a Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer. And at the time, I didn't really know Cinema 4D. And they asked me like, hey, we're working on this main movie title for Marvel. Do you know cinema? Because that's what our artists are working on. And it's like, I didn't want the opportunity to pass up, especially because I've been like a huge comic book nerd ever since I was little. And so I was just like, yeah, of course I know cinema. So I kind of dove in there, learned it. Like, I want to say over the course of a couple of nights, like I would just stay at the studio until like 3 a.m. Just going through auto documentation because there was really no tutorials back then. And I just kind of fell in love with being able to work in cinema. And then once I was able to work with some of the artists there and they showed me how to incorporate it with After Effects, it was almost like, you know, game over from there. Cause it's like, I could take stuff from cinema, bring it into After Effects, you know, polish it up in there, you know, with the different plugins and things of that nature. So that's been pretty much my workflow moving from that point forward would be, you know, going to 3D and then bring it into After Effects to finalize everything out. Cool. You also do a fair amount of particles too, as well, don't you? I do. Yes. Yes. So experimenting with all the different type of particle systems out there. I do. I'm looking forward to John's presentation on Particle Illusion 2021 because I've been diving into it, as you know, just like here and there whenever I get time. But I really want to see what John does because that's that's probably one of the next things I really want to dive into is really learning Particle Illusion and be able to incorporate that more into my workflow. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, Particle Illusion, for those that don't know, is a, a, a plugin that's part of the Continuum package. We also sell it as a, a premium filter, what it's called, where you can buy one of the Continuum filters on its own. And uh, we have a free version, which we shipped. Ryan, when was that? <laughs> it's been a blur yeah. last couple of months. I think it was uh, about a month ago, two months ago. Yeah, I want to say last month. Yeah. Yeah. It was in the summer. It feels like a year ago. <laughs> like everything it was probably about it's a month a, ago. Uh, it's yeah. been a crazy time for everyone, right? But yeah, yeah so uh, yeah. that's like uh, particle illusion is a really cool way that you can, uh, you know, generate very quick uh, particles. In fact, a lot of a lot of uh, game companies used to use it back in the day. And Boris FX acquired Particle Illusion uh, through the Gen Arts acquisition, and we've been mm -hmm. developing quite a lot. So stay tuned for that that session. Yeah, and I'll, yeah, I'll love to put enough, out this. Oh, go ahead, John. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say, funny enough, when, like, I brought up using combustion in art school, I believe Particle Illusion was a part of that back in the day, right? Because I remember that was, like, my first acquisition into Particle Illusion. Yeah, Wonder Touch stuff was originally, you know, yeah, part of that. And then, they, you know, Alan Lawrence, actually the creator of, of Wonder Touch, now works for Boris FX, so... Um, He's been doing quite a lot to update this application. We're pretty excited at the direction that it's going. In fact, the, even now, uh, it's linked to Mocha. So the, the Park Illusion plugin, you know, has, it has Mocha tracking in it and have some really cool features that I can't really talk about here, but uh, that's going to be coming up uh, soon. So should we uh, should we get into should we get into it a little bit? Um, yeah. I'm really interested in seeing you know. How, how what, sort of just learning why you know everyone probably who's watching now probably has heard quite a lot about Unreal Engine 
right? As a, not only as a, a, a game uh, development tool, but there's been so much buzz in the last six months or a year about uh, Epic and Unreal Engine for virtual production, for real time graphics. And I think it's really cool that you've been exploring it for, you know, from a different direction from the motion graphics and design direction. Right. Yeah. So my biggest, um, the biggest reason I jumped into it, um, one last year during SIGGRAPH, I think, yeah, I saw you at last year's SIGGRAPH when they announced the, the merger between Cinema 4D and Unreal. So that gave me the confidence to try to dive into Unreal because I could take, you know, my basic knowledge of 3D that I already knew and incorporate that into Unreal. But the thing that really got me was like right now I have several computers that I use for offline rendering. And my electric bill is like crazy every month. Like I say, like four, five hundred dollars crazy. And that's just from, you know, the GPU rendering through auto machines in my farm here. And so once I saw like what people were doing over at like Quixel, they were doing photo real imagery all in real time at like 60 frames per second off of one GPU. I was like, man, I have to try this because it would save me a lot in my electric bill, which it has. So that's like, that was my main reason for jumping into Unreal because I'm like, I have to save money. It's getting too crazy down here. And yeah, I mean, the past couple of projects that I've been working on over the summer, I've been working off the one box here. I have the AMD Threadripper 3 with a 2080 Ti in it. And that's like all I need. Like my other computer, I'm, I like, I don't even use those anymore. So it's been pretty wild. That's very cool. And do you and do you incorporate the Mega Scan stuff, the Quixel stuff, uh, into your work a lot? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've been a Mega Scans user since day one, even before they were acquired by Epic. And oh, cool. like it just like I do a lot of stuff for Discovery Channel and History Channel, like a lot of CG explainers, as you saw in the demo reel, where I have to make a lot of outdoor environments. And so it's just kind of like, it was the perfect mix. Cause once I was able to incorporate those photogrammetry assets, then like the clients were just blowing away. They're like, wow, your stuff went from this to this like overnight. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, I've been practicing. <laughs> so I didn't share the secret sauce, but yeah, I mean, the mega scans assets were essential to just elevate my stuff to that next level. That's very cool. And then it's, I mean, I don't really know myself, but how many, I mean, they have so many libraries in there. I mean, it's, for those who don't know, it's very high resolution scans of all kinds of materials, real world textures, you know, dirt, stone, brick, I mean, everything, right? Yeah, like they started off as mostly like doing like cliff sides and rocks and a lot of textures like for mud and grass and stuff of that nature. But over the past couple of years, I mean, they just really expanded. Like they even have toys on there now. Like if you type in teddy bear, you'll see like a photogrammetry 3D model of like a teddy bear. So they just been going crazy, like scanning anything that could get their hands on. And I think the last number I saw was like over... 10,000 assets or something that they have readily available on there right now. So, wow, and it's all amazing. completely free since they got bought out by Epic. As long as you have an Epic account and your final render is using Unreal Engine, like you have all those assets at your disposal. So you're free to use them in like all your broadcast packages or movies. Like the thing that they did over the summer was if you're making like, if you're using this for anything but making a video game, the Unreal Engine is 100% free. Like you don't have to pay them any type of royalties or anything on the back end. But like if you make a game and your game revenue is like a million dollars, then you have to start paying them 5%. But like if your game only makes 900,000, then that's all yours to keep. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty incredible platform. I mean, not only all the real time stuff, all the free assets, and then of course the uh, third party, you know, asset collections and everything. But then just uh, that that from Unreal, just from a developer point of view, you know, you can develop for any platform really. You know, whether it's uh, you know all the game, you know, Xbox and different games and iOS and virtual reality applications. It, it's really, really a uh, very impressive environment from the development point of view as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you want to, want to dive in and uh, talk about this show, show some stuff we'd love to see. Yeah. Let's get into it. Yeah. So if we, um, if we look at my desktop here, like I'm in Adobe Illustrator. So this is where I started from. So just a quick background on this, like I'm a, 
I guess you would call it like an Epic ambassador now. And so I'm taking the Unreal Engine logo and I'm going to be animating them in like different type of environments. So the one that I'm showing you today is like my debut of what I've been working on with Epic. And this one is called Naturalistic. And so I'll be showing you the May Scans assets that I've used and kind of how I incorporated my 3D knowledge into Unreal and then how I can render this out in real time, bring it into After Effects and then start applying like the Sapphire effects just to kind of polish it and give it that final shine. And so like this right here is just a vector image that I was given to work with. And so I went from this into the animation that um, that you guys could queue up now, the Unreal Engine animation that I sent you guys earlier. Very cool. Yeah, let me know when it's done playing. I can't see it on my screen. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, it's just looping. It's played a couple times. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I went from a 2D vector um, Unreal logo here into what you're seeing on the screen there. And so what I'm going to do is give you a brief overview of the steps that I took. So I started here in Illustrator. And for those that don't know, you can bring your stuff from Illustrator into Cinema 4D as a vector file. And then once you bring it into Cinema, let me see if I can actually do this live. Hopefully, I need to save this out. Okay, so I have that asset already built and I'm just going to save it out so that I can bring it into cinema. And the main thing with this is we need to save it as an Illustrator 8 file just to be able to bring it into cinema. I'm not really sure why that's still the case, but I'm going to click OK here. Then when I open up cinema, it's as easy as coming over to file and merge object. And then I just have to find that Illustrator file right here and click OK. Yes, so now we have it in our scene. Now we click on it and forgive me because we're working at 1080 right now. So I'm not used to working at this resolution. But let me go and click start up here. There we go. So if I come down to my coordinates, I usually start by zeroing everything out. And then I need to make this a little bit larger because it came in really, really tiny here. So I'm going to come over to my scale here, maybe do like 17 by 17. And then if I scroll this down, you can see that it brings in like a whole bunch of different splines. And it depends on how like the vector was made to begin with. But I mean, it's a really easy fix. Like what I found is I usually like to separate these out and then just start turning these off just to kind of see what is what. And so like I know that these two splines here make the outer ring. So what I'm going to do is select these two, just right click and then come down to connect objects plus delete. And there we go. So now I have my outer ring that I can make this into 3D. And then this one right here should be the Unreal U. Yeah, so we have that there. And then I brought in these other extra splines, which I'm just going to delete because we only need these two splines here. And so I'm just going to show you real quick how I can make this into 3D. It's as easy as coming down to extrude and then just dragging my spline underneath it. And now we have a 3D object here. And if I hit H, it should bring it in full screen. I think we were pretty full screen, but now I want to kind of like, it has like a really hard edge here. So like one of the things that I was taught early on is nothing really truly has like a really sharp edge. There's always some type of little bevel there. And so it's as easy as coming over to caps down here. And I'm using cinema R21 by the way for this. And we have some presets down here that I could just load preset. And I like to use this one, the basic rounding. I usually click on this. And you can see that it looks like it didn't really bevel it. And that's because sometimes it depends on how your vector is brought in, but we just have to manipulate it down here a little bit. So if I come down here to bevel outside, now you can see we're getting a, be a better bevel on the edges here. And I'm just going to bring the sizing down a little bit because it kind of puffed it out too much. So I found around like three or two is usually suffice. So somewhere around there. And then that's the basics of how I brought the Unreal logo into Cinema 4D. So from there, if I hold down Control, drag it, and I already have like my preset already here, and I could just drag my other spline into this. And there we go. Now I have the Unreal logo all built out in 3D. And if you get, if I pull in here, you can see it's a little bit jagged here. And so if I click on my spline, I can easily smooth this out by coming over down here and there my object tab where it says intermediate points, I usually like to come here and click natural. 
And then I'll just add a bunch of points in here, maybe like 50. And that should smooth it out. And it's like my final end game is bringing this into Unreal. So I can have like a higher polygon count like that and still be able to play everything back in real time. So I'm going to do the same thing on my U logo here. Come down to natural, make it 50 points instead of eight. And there we go. Now we have a nice and smooth logo. So I'm not going to go through 100%, like make it a tutorial step by step. I just want to show you guys like how I could bring it in from a flat vector and then make it 3D. And then the next step from there is I already have my scene already built out here. And so this is what I'm going to be bringing into Unreal. And so I have the rest of the logo letters down here built the same exact way. And if I come in from the start and click play, you can see I have my camera animation and everything going in there is really simple. Like I have a camera here and I have a target and this target's looking at this null. And what that does is it allows me to, no matter where my camera is moving at, it's always going to be pointing at that null. And so I like using this a lot just for camera direction, because like if you try to animate your camera and just, you know, do it all manually by hand, sometimes you'll get some wonky keyframes in there. So I always kind of like to have like some type of point of interest that I could look at, which if I bring it back some, you can see this is my null point and this is exactly where my camera is always going to be looking at. And so if I look over here on the sides, as we were talking earlier, these are actually the mega scans assets. And if you could, you could tell like my scene isn't exactly fully built out. Like if I bring back up my animation, that's these two objects right here on the sides. And so what I like to do is I kind of like to block out my scene inside of Cinema 4D. Like I know a lot of people have been hitting me up like, hey, I have my scene completely built in Cinema 4D. I want to bring it into Unreal to render out in real time. And some of the stuff isn't translating well. And I kind of look at it as like Unreal is the final destination where all the pieces are kind of be put together. So I kind of like using Cinema as like my blocking stage. And then once I'm inside of Unreal, that's when I really start liking to bring my scene together and bringing everything to life. And so I'll just have like some basic objects built here in Cinema. Like if I go over here, and this is a quick tip too. Like these are my Megascan assets. And these codes right here, usually before where it says LOD, these are the codes for that asset. So if I copy this, let me hit Control C. And then if I open up Quixel Bridge, and this is comes free with your your um your Epic account here. So Bridge is basically where we can see all of our Megascans assets. And of course, it's not gonna. Let me open this again. I'm running this off a of NOS server, so I think I might need to spin it up. Maybe it was. The joys of go. streaming. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those things, like I, I ran through it a million times this morning, and then, of course, when you start streaming. But just I think everyone way, watching like, knows exactly, know. yeah, <laughs> knows exactly <laughs> where we're going. Yeah, I have some good stories at the end of the stream doing this stuff live. And yeah, <laughs> let's save that for later. But okay, just to reiterate, like I'm using this code right here. Like if you ever need to go back and see what assets you're using inside of Bridge, you copy that and then you can paste it up here inside your search bar. And so just a quick overview of what this is. This is Quixel Bridge. And this is where you can have like complete asset or access to all your assets that you have from Megascans here. And so usually... The first thing you'll see is like the latest stuff that they've uploaded. Like it looks like they just uploaded some stuff the other day, these mosaic tiles. And we have 100% access to these. So if you go to collection, it will give you a rundown of all the stuff that we can start downloading from here. So if I just click on it, you just click download and you're good to go. Like you come over to your download settings, you can pick what kind of resolution you want to download at. So I usually do 4K because sometimes 8K is overkill, but you have all these different you know, just things at your disposal. But I like to keep things usually under the material preset at Unreal 4. And that gives me everything that I need that when I bring everything into Unreal, everything is pretty much plug and play from there. It's like I'm not rebuilding these textures inside of Unreal or even Cinema anymore. It's kind of like you export it out and then everything's just ready to go. So at that point, it's kind of like playing with Legos. You just drag and drop it in your scene and just really start playing around with it. Let me come back over to home. 
and I'm gonna hit Control V to paste this in here. And so this is the asset that I'm using here. And if I click on it, you can see over here, this is our preview window and you can actually do like a 3D view of it. So if I actually wanted to, you know, get like a good glimpse of what it's gonna look like before I bring it in, you have a 3D view of it. And then you can also look at your maps and everything here as well. And this is easy as once you're like ready to export your 3D model out, just come over here to export. And then you just pick the settings that you want. So say like, I want to export this out to cinema, but you have a whole bunch of different other stuff here too, like 3D Max and Maya and Blender, but I'm going to pick cinema. And I'm just going to export this real quick for you guys so you can see how fast it is. So up here in the upper right hand corner, you're just going to wait for it to say successful. There we go. Export successful. So I can make this smaller. And as soon as you come back into cinema, I can already see it like in my scene here. And it has the textures and everything already included on there. So from there, it's kind of like you just build out your scene and then you can render it and you're all set to go. So the next step is, and if you have any questions, please feel free to jump in. I know I'm going kind of quick here. I want to show you guys a bunch of stuff. Oops. I think this is a great, great speed. I mean, you're already, you're already showing some really useful, uh, you know, things to the audience, you know, just even the idea of, uh, you know, using mega scans with Cinema 4D and how simple, simple that process was very cool. Yeah. Wait until I get into the, the Sapphire stuff. I think that's the stuff that people are, are they're not going to be, they're going to be like, oh, wow. I didn't think of using it with Unreal in that sense, but let me, um, yeah, I'll get through this part first. And so the one big thing with exporting your scene out from cinema into Unreal is sometimes the keyframes don't translate 100% well, especially if you use stuff like this. Like I, like I was saying before, I like usually having a target and looking at it. And the one thing that like Unreal doesn't translate directly from cinema or stuff like this. So if I would bring this into Unreal, it would give me my basic keyframe information. Like if I come down to coordinates, it would give me all these keyframes, but these don't have keyframes attached to it. So if I play through this on my timeline, you can see that, you know, our rotation is moving because we have it looking at our null point, but it doesn't have any keyframes on there. And so the way that Unreal likes to bring stuff over, and I, I believe this is with Blender as well, is anything that has keyframes is going to 100% translate those keyframes over into Unreal. And so the one trick that I kind of developed to get around that is if I come over to my layout window here, come down to animate. Now I have like all my keyframes down here and I can see exactly what's going on. And what I want to do from here is I want to bake out my camera here. And that way, whenever I bake it out, it's going to give me all the keyframes. And so even if I don't need those keyframes, it's still going to give me keyframe information in there. And I can kind of delete stuff from there. So I'm going to click on my camera, come down to functions. And then right here where it says bake objects, I'm going to click on that. And then right here where it says include, I usually hit all parameters just to be on the safe side. And I have everything checked here. And so it's like my scene is 500 frames. I want to bake all the expressions, just everything in there. So I'm going to click OK. And it usually goes pretty quick. As you can see, like it made a copy of my camera right there. And it will usually put um, like these markings and copy there. So you know which your original and which your copy. And what I like to do is I usually like to type in baked. Just so I know that this is the camera with the baked keyframes. And then if I look down here inside of my timeline, I have all my rotation keyframes down here as well. So if I click on this right here, you can see it has my keyframes there. And if I scroll through, we have all the information that we need now to bring it into Unreal Engine. So my next step from here is the process of saving this out for Unreal Engine. So we're gonna finally get into there. So I'm just gonna come back down to my startup window here. And this is the tricky part, depending on what version of cinema you're using. And so it seemed like with the last couple of versions, they renamed this or put this in different spots. And so like I'm working in R21. And so the way that you're able to get this file into Unreal is there's a file here called say, or there's a tab here called say project for Cineware. And in previous versions, it was called say project for my launch, but it should be in the same exact spot. And I believe in S22, it's in the same spot here as well. It's called Cineware in S22. And so what I'm going to do is click this and it's just going to save out a Cinema 4D file, but it's going to have more baked information inside of it so that Unreal could translate everything. So if I come over here and let's just name this one 
I'll name this one Boris test. And then click save. And depending on how big your scene is, I mean, it could go quick or it could take a little bit of time. But what it's going to do is make a Cinema 4D file for you. And if I come over here, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is my original Cinema 4D file here. And if I, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. If I scroll this over, you can see that it's keeping the file sizes in this case about the same. But I've brought in some pretty big files, like it will say like my original file is only like 300 megabytes, but like to say for Cineware file would be like a gig or something like that. So especially once you start using like MoGraph cloners and stuff, it could get pretty heavy. So that's something to be leery about as well. In those type of cases, I usually tell people like bring your stuff in pieces, like just don't bring your entire scene into Unreal. Maybe take some stuff that is stationary, bring that over as its file and then stuff that's animated, bring those over in their files and you should be able to manage it better that way. But now that we have our file here, we're ready for Unreal Engine. And let me actually close out Cinema because I don't want stuff to start crashing. So I'm going to start closing out some of these programs. Cool. So I have my project here. This is my final project, but I want to show you guys how I bring my stuff in from Cinema 4D. So I'm going to come over to the Epic Games Launcher. And this is where I'm going to set everything up. <clears throat> and um, oh yeah, this is a very cool thing that I love showing people. So of course, the, the top dog in this umbrella is Epic Games, and they make the games like Fortnite and Rocket League and things of that nature. And maybe last year, they actually opened up a game store on here. And so, like for us, usually when we open up the Epic Games Launcher, we only see the Unreal tab here. But if you come down here to Settings, there is this tab here. It says Hide Game, or Hide game Library. So if I click on this and click back, now you can see we have more tabs here. If I click on my library tab, these are going to have all the different video games that I got free from Epic. So this is just something quick that I like showing people because it's like every two weeks, Epic actually gives away a free video game. And so like I have stuff down here, like even all the Batman games and Borderlands. And yeah, it's kind of crazy. The games that they give away, like they even gave away Grand Theft Auto 5 at one point. And so to get those, you just click on the store tab here. And then it's like right here, front and center. So these are the free games that you could get with your Epic account. And they're 100% free. Like I never Hor bought a game horribly, here at all. But... Horribly dangerous. Horribly dangerous, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, but it's like, these are the type of things. It's like, I get them just because they're free. Even if I'm not going to play them, I just grab them. Like you just click on it and then come down yeah. here. And I would just say like, you know, you have the free tab. You just click purchase. Then it's yours forever. So I always tell people like, Make sure you, if you're a gamer, just go in there, grab whatever you can. Like Hitman's coming out. That's a great game. And then, um, yeah, so that's just the bonus of working with this stuff. But I always like showing people that totally. just because really cool. they don't, they don't even, even know like even, they have a game store there. Yeah. Even beyond the games, that's all cool. the stuff that's available for Unreal, you know, there's tons of free stuff. And I think Epic gives away certain free, free assets every month as well. Right. Yeah. So if I come over here to the marketplace. Let me click on this tab here. And then this right here, also Twin Motion. I haven't missed with this, but I know that's another acquisition that they bought. I think it's more for like ArchViz stuff, but that's another yes. program that they're giving you free that I believe is like ArchViz for real time. Some um, some case, I haven't really looked into it because, yeah, Unreal has been enough to try to learn. But yeah, that's um, something that you get free as well. And then um, as you were saying, if you come over to Marketplace, Come down here to the free tab. You have like a couple of different libraries here. Like this is free for the month. If I click on this, like I think every second of the month, they give you a bunch, they give you five free assets. And all you have to do is add them to your cart and purchase them for free. And then they're yours to keep for however long you want to use them. So if you go over to free, come down to free for the month. That's the stuff that you have free for that month. You just have to make sure you purchase it before it goes away and add the next ones. And then underneath here, we have permanently free collection, which I use a lot of stuff in here, which they have. This is really cool down here. We have a vehicle pack. We have like a bunch of vegetation, photo vegetation, 
So I would definitely say come to the free tab before you even like start purchasing anything. More than likely, the stuff that you want is already in here. Like we have a VFX panel in here as well. If I click on it, usually it will have a video that you can play back or some descriptions and stuff of what you're getting. But yeah, that's on top of the mega scan stuff is like you get all this other free stuff as well. And also they give away some of their old video game stuff. So I think there was a game called Paragon, no, Infinity Blade. So it's a game I don't think they make anymore, but they give you access to all those levels and you can use them for your own projects, which is crazy in itself. So it's like the levels are already built out. You can kind of go in and just kind of break them down on how they built them and, you know, kind of um, backwards engineer them just to kind of help you out with your workflow. So we have that as well. Man, it's Even almost overwhelming. It's almost overwhelming how much free assets there are. Like, like it's crippling <laughs> when you think about it. Like all of these choices, uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I would say that um, we can say, we can thank all the kids out there that have been playing Fortnite and buying oh, yeah. a lot of Fortnite skins yeah. and dances because I think 100%. it's like they make like a trillion dollars a day or something crazy just off of Fortnite <laughs> alone. So it's kind of like <laughs> you know you make so much money off of that. It's like why not? You know, so it's um yeah. it's crazy. Like I even know like as you guys as developers, like if you throw stuff up up on the marketplace. I believe it's like an 80-20 split or something crazy, like 80% for the developers and 20% goes to Epic, which is like unheard of. Like it's crazy. So yeah, they're being very generous there. And very these cool. are just all the different assets that I've collected over the years. And I was going to run through some of the ones that I use in this project. Like I use Amplified LUT Pack, which is really cool because we can actually add LUTs into our scene and Unreal Engine, like, you know, before you had to usually go to like an NLE or something like that. But with Unreal, we can actually add LUT packs in there. We have some pretty cool materials. It's called the Automotive Pack, but I use the materials because they're nice and shiny and already built. So it's as easy as click to add to your project and everything will be there once you open it up. And then um, there's one last one here. I believe it was called Particle Wind, maybe. Yeah, particle and wind control, which I'm not 100% um, fluent in their particle system yet in Unreal, but these were just kind of a bunch of presets similar to particle illusion. Like you have some presets, you throw them in there and you're good to go. And so those are some of the assets that I've used in this project here. But enough of me yapping away. Let me show you guys how to bring some stuff into Unreal. So I'm going to scroll up here. And the latest version right now is 4.25.3. So I'm just going to launch this one. And then it should pop up with a panel with a bunch of different templates to work off of. So one of the cool things that they've been really implementing over the last year is expanding Unreal for like broadcast design and automotive design and a bunch of different categories other than just using it for games. So this is pretty new. I think they just added this in the last version of Unreal, but now before like we only had this game template here but now we have template for film and television for architectural and engineering and automotive manufacturing and stuff of that nature so i'm going to click on film television and live events here click next and then i'm just going to start with a blank slate click next again and then this is cool because before you had to like type in the code to be able to enable ray tracing, but now we could kind of just enable ray tracing off the top. So like I have a 2080 Ti in here, which is more than enough to handle ray tracing. Like I believe anything from the 10 series on, I think you could do ray tracing with. And so I'm just going to leave my project file down here as is. I'm just going to rename it Boris and click create project. And the cool thing too about this, like I have Unreal running in the back and I'm opening up like another version of Unreal and I usually don't take a hit. So sometimes I'll have like several versions open up depending on what I'm working on. Yeah, there we go. So now I have a blank scene. This is what you first get when you open the Unreal Engine. I know it could be a little bit daunting if it's your first time looking in here. The first thing that you'll see down here, I don't know why it does this, but it says project file is out of date. I usually just click update and we're good there. And then it will say do plugins are available. So like I have, I've been testing all Octane in here and stuff like that. And it usually always makes this pop up now for some reason, but I'll hit dismiss and we should be good to go there. 
So the very first thing I like to do is start deleting stuff out of my project that I don't need because I like working with a blank slate. So this is like a ground plane that they have in here. So I hit delete. And then this right here, this player start, this is usually for if you're making like a game, I'm not sure why it's inside the film assets, but it's like whenever you hit the start button up here, if I scroll over, there's a play button here and that's like where you would play like your game. So if like you have an Xbox controller or if you're using the keyboard and mouse, you can navigate through your scene as if it was like a video game. But I usually have my camera information already ready to go. So I'll delete player start because I only use Unreal for cinematics. And then the sky sphere, if I scroll up, it automatically has like a sky in here off default. And you can come down here and mess with the different settings and stuff. You can see the clouds are moving. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. But I'm going to delete that as well. And then we have atmospheric fog, which I'm going to delete because I like using their other fog. But I like starting off with a blank slate here. <clears throat> sorry, give me a second. I get some water. All right, cool. So the first steps that we need, like I already have this permanently enabled and I actually did a tutorial on how to do this. So whenever you first open up Unreal, there's gonna be a blank slate here. And this DataSmith plugin is how we import stuff from Cinema 4D into Unreal. But when you're like first getting into it, this isn't gonna be in here, you have to activate it. And so to be able to do that, I'm gonna come over to settings, plugins, and then if you click on built-in and then just type C4D, it's going to say data smith importer and you just have to enable it and then it's going to restart and then you'll be good to go from there so next step is click data smith i'm going to come over and find where i had that file that i saved out there we go so i want to use this one here boris test click open and i'm just going to click ok leave everything check marked on here click import and depending again on how large your scene is, sometimes this is going to take a minute or two. But once your scene's in here, now we have all of our stuff from Cinema 4D in here. And we could just start bringing stuff in from mega scans and start populating the scene. And if I come over here, you can see down here my content browser. If I click on the animation panel here or the folder here, you'll see that it brings in, this is called Sequencer. And so what Sequencer is, it's the timeline that we use in Unreal Engine and it brings our timeline from cinema into Unreal. So if I double click on this, it's gonna pop open the sequencer tab and it's gonna look as close as it can to how we had everything built out inside of Cinema 4D. So you can see we have all the different assets that we have in there. We have the extrusions and we have, you know, we have this right here, the circle. But the main thing here is the camera. So I wanna click on my bait camera here click on the camera button here. Now, when I play it back, now this is everything that we had from Cinema 4D. We have our animations locked. And then from here, it's kind of just, you know, like, like I say, playing with Legos, I would just take stuff from Bridge, import it into Unreal and just start really populating this scene up and building everything around it. And so at the end of the day, I'm going to close this one out. So at the end of the day, we have something like this. And so I took just these assets from Megascans. If I come down to my favorites. So these are all the different assets that I used to populate that scene out. And as you can see, it's just a couple, like I just, I would usually just bring it in, just twist and turn and, you know, play with the scaling and things of that nature. And once I have something that I'm happy with, actually, let me come down to my sequencer. There we go. So this is what it looks like inside of Unreal. You can see I have some a bunch of lights in this scene just to kind of give me the depth and the mood that I'm looking for. And if I hit G on my keyboard, it will take away all these attribute windows. There we go. So now we have a nice clean scene. These are just some of the fireflies that I got from the marketplace. You just drag and drop them into your scene. We have some nice fog in here. If I come over to my world outliner, let me pull this up. There we go. So this is the other fog that I like to use. This one gives us a better sense of, you know, like depth inside of our fog and everything. So if I turn this off, this is what my scene looks like without that fog. And then if I turn it on, that's what it does with the fog. So it interacts everything in your scene really, really well. If you want to find it, you just come over to place actors, type in fog, 
and it's this one here. It's as easy as dragging and dropping, and then you have it in your scene there. So I'm gonna control Z that out. And then um, yeah, the next thing I know we're running short on time. So I kind of want to show you guys the real time rendering and then how we bring it into After Effects. And so once I have my scene and everything built out the way that I like it, I like to come over to window, come down to cinematics. And this is the new way that we render out of Unreal. It's called movie render queue. If I click on this and then click on this green button here, I just have to find the sequence that I want to render out. So it's going to be this one here. And then it's as easy as going to settings. I'm going to delete this kind of like rendering out as EXR files. So when I click on this setting here, we have all these different type of files in here. And I believe in the next version, they're going to start adding, you know, like more variations like QuickTime and stuff like that. But for here, I'm going to click on EXR. And then my output settings, I'm just going to render this to my desktop maybe. So let me see, make a new folder here. Click select, because this is my favorite part. I like showing people in Unreal. I'm going to leave everything else at default. And so this scene that I have right here is running at 60 frames per second. I have about 521 frames that I'm going to render out. So if I click render local, give us a second to bring everything in. But you can see in real time, it's rendering everything out. And it's at pretty good quality there. So it tells you, you know, estimated time down here. I think it started at around 30 seconds. But yeah, I mean, this is like 500 frames, which would have took me a ton of time, like hours upon hours before. And it's like, I'm getting these type of results right now in front of your eyes, which is incredible. Yeah, definitely impressive speeds. What resolution are you working at there as far as your render file? That one, um, I rendered that one out as 1920 by 1080. But yeah. for the file that I sent you guys, I actually did that one at 4K, which I could render it out at 4K if you want, but I know we're running short on time. Yeah, here, that's so okay. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to show you guys how quick we can knock this stuff out. But that's my main file there. And then if I, this is something that I've came up with because this is the old render system that allows us to render out different passes. So if I'm in my sequencer window and I hit this over here, where it says image output format, we have all these different other, like this is the old way that we used to render cinematics, which sometimes gave us not so desirable results. That's why they start working on this new way. But the one cool thing is if I click custom render passes, now we can render out like depth of field and ambient occlusion, which I really like the depth of field one, because as you know, Ross, I love working with uh, the Sapphire fog and the depth of field and everything once I bring it into After Effects. And so this gives me that depth information that I need to be able to work with the plugins inside of After Effects. And so let me pop open After Effects and let me attempt to construct this in real time in front of you guys showing you guys all the stuff that we're doing with the Sapphire plugin. So how are we doing on time? Are we good or? We're, we're doing okay. I think we're getting yeah. a little tight. Right? There's a, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't want to, I don't want to rush you, but you know, we can go for another 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let me do a breakdown of what I have here inside of my scene. And so just real quick, these are my files that I've rendered out of Unreal Engine. So I have my, my, um, I guess you would say color pass here, and I just do a levels on here. And then I have my ambient occlusion pass, which if I bring this up a little bit, like I just like using ambient occlusion just to add a little bit of shadow because it does come out kind of crunchy. It's not unreal sometimes. So I usually crunch it with levels a little bit and then just drop the opacity down to maybe like 13 just to kind of give it that little bit of detail in there. So if you see me click this on and off, you can see we're getting some nice, you know, ambient occlusion and the crevices and stuff there. And then my other one is my depth pass here. So this is all my Z depth information. And what I had to do for this one is you can tell that this is inside of a pre comp and that's because I like adding levels to it just to kind of accentuate, you know, like get more of that detail that I wanted in there. So if I double click on my um, pre comp here, you can see that I really crushed it with levels. Like this is what it looks like coming out of Unreal which is fine. I mean, we have a good variation between the different gray hues and the white hues, but I like to crunch it just because I like I was going for more of a stylistic approach to this one. And so I really wanted to be able to use the Z depth information out of the Sapphire plugins here. So that's why I did it that way. And the reason it has to be inside of a pre-comp 
is because for some reason inside of my comp here, if I added the levels on this level, it doesn't recognize it. And this is across the board with After Effects. Like it didn't, it doesn't recognize the levels in here. So I always have to put it in the levels in the pre comp and then bring that pre comp into my main scene and everything is good to go. So these are the um, Sapphire plugins that I'm using for this right now. And so I have a fog path, I have a depth pass, I have uh, the lens flare. I have even the vignette. So shout out to Angie Taylor because I'm using her preset as I'll show you here in a minute. And then I'm using a little bit of the cartoon paint. Like if I click on T, the opacity, I brought it down to six, but I just like the way that cartoon, like I'm using the Van Gogh preset. I believe that, um, uh, man, I can't remember his name, but I'll click on the preset here in a minute, but he made that one. And then last but not least, I always like using the warp chroma just to add a little bit of chromatic apparition in there. So let me turn my fog on and kind of just go through what I did here. And so I change, if I click on reset, you can see that this is what it looks like right off the bat whenever we bring in our fog pass here. And I like bringing these in just on, like I usually right click and then make an adjustment layer. And I like just kind of stacking them in my scene. I know like some people like putting them on their actual footage, but I feel like I get more control when I bring these onto adjustment layers. So that's the way that I like to work there. And then if I, let me hit control Z. So what I did here was in my Z buffer path, I just clicked on my depth pass that I brought from Unreal out. And then it gives me control of my fog density. So I wanted it to be a little bit brownish in here. Like I didn't want it to be just completely white. So I zipped my Z buffer type before, like by default, this is white as near, but I made black near just because of the way that Unreal, you know, they render out their Z depth pass. And then from here, it's kind of just going in and controlling until I find something that I like there. So I liked how the fog was just creeping around the rocks around there. So I think it was around 0.9. And once I'm happy with that, I like to add in just like a depth pass. So if I turn this one on, you can see that we're starting to really get faded out back here. It's giving us all the focus here on the Unreal logo. Um, yeah, the Unreal logo here. And so what I do here is I kind of go to low preset. And this is the way I typically work with the Boris Effect plugin. Like I usually like to hit low preset, kind of look around in here first to see what comes up. And I think I did it for Z focus. Let me see. Yeah, so I think I started with the one that says shallow here and then just kind of adjust my parameters from there. So the, the main way I like working with the Sapphire Suite is come in, you know, find a preset that I want to get it as a jumping off point and then kind of, you know, adjust everything from there. And so the next one is lens flare, which I mean, you know, we could go on for hours about lens flares. You could go in and custom build these out any way that you want. And even if you load a preset, there's always jumping off points there. It's um, very intuitive how we could build out our lenses from there. But the one I wanted to really show was the vignette because before even working on this project, I didn't even realize these had presets in there. So if I click on and off, I mean, it's kind of like night and day, like this looks like Indiana Jones and this, you know, this looks good, but it just like really enhanced the way that my project was looking. And the first thing I did once I saw that, cause I didn't know Sapphire even had vignette before. So it's like, oh man, they have vignette. So I went into the load preset just because that's the first thing I do. I'm curious to what other artists are doing out there. And if I scroll this down, you can see we have like a whole plethora of different type of presets in here. And they all look pretty cool. Like this one looked really cinematic. I liked this one at first, but then I was scrolling down and I saw this one, the Warman Sintra, which is again by Angie Taylor. So shout out to Angie. But I felt like this one was like, really, I really needed to drive it home. And so I just clicked load from there. And usually I come in and start playing with the parameters, but I just, I don't know. I just really like the way that this looked right off the bat. So shout out to Angie. This looks great. And then I came over to make a cartoon paint filter. So again, because it's kind of like, I don't, I know like chromatic apparition will help you kind of not make everything so sharp. So, so it doesn't look so CG, but since I like going for more stylistic approaches, 
I was just coming in here just to see what kind of um, presets we could play around with, with side, inside the paint tool here. So I saw this one here, Van Gone, which I thought looked pretty interesting. And yes, that was it. John Dickinson. I don't know why I forgot his name before, but he came out with this really cool preset, which I played around with inside the um, the new optics plugin that you guys had just recently released. Like I was playing around with that. I did a tutorial on that. And so this kind of reminded me of some of the stuff I was doing inside of optics. And so I immediately clicked this on because I just kind of liked how it gives me like that brushed approach around the edges there. And so I didn't want to make it too overbearing. So what I did was I came under my opacity and I just dropped it down just so we had a little hint of it. So when you watch it in 4K, you can really see what it's doing there. But if I scroll this up, you can see that we're getting some really cool effects, which I don't really see a lot of artists doing these days. Like even at 19%, I mean, I really, I like the painted look that it's given my my um, my um animation here. And so just to top everything off, I always like to bring in chromatic apparition and that just makes it so everything isn't so sharp and it looks a little bit better whenever it plays back on the screen. So again, I come over to load preset here and there's usually one, I think it's just settle. Yeah, so I use this one, the settle warp one. And that one gives me a good jumping off point. And so I'll click load there. And then I usually come over to Z distance and just start playing around here. So I'll find something I like, I think around there is good. And then, um, excuse me. Yeah, we are good to go from there. And so that is my workflow. Let me hit control Very Z. cool, John. Um, Very cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll take any questions. I know I was going a little bit longer. I could yeah. run through this I stuff all it. day. But. <laughs> Such good stuff. It's so fun to watch. Um, so fun to watch you kind of, you know, that you've obviously mastered this whole Unreal, like C4D, AE, and um, Sapphire. Um, also, lo love to see you using like, yeah, Vignette for color correction, which is just something that you would never think like that's the beauty of all the Sapphire plugins. They're so deep and multifaceted um, that someone like Angie was going to get into vignette and basically create like a color grading tool. Most people wouldn't think that when they vignette. So smart to always go into the presets and kind of see like what this effect can yeah. do in all the different outputs. Um, I'm not someone, someone has to, at all. So the presets oh. really help out with that. Yeah. Um, quick, quick questions. Um, someone wanted to know, is it, is it better to use a PNG um, versus using an EXR for your depth passes? Does it matter? No. Um, typically, like an offline rendering, I usually like to use, um, I know PNGs get pretty heavy inside of After Effects, just, but just for like sizing, just of my hard drives and stuff like that, like PNGs are a lot smaller when compared to EXRs. And so like for my main pass, I usually use the EXR just because of the color depth that it gives you. And then for any type of render pass stuff, whether it's like shadows or depth of field or, you know, ambient occlusion, you just do PNG because the way it work, I'm usually just going to have a hint of it in there anyway. And so it's like, I don't need a ton of information in there. Usually I'm in there messing with the levels to kind of manipulate it and get it the way that I want. So I typically will go PNG just more to save space on my hard drive. And one more question from the audience. Um, can you recommend some tutorials for people looking to kind of get into this? Like, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of After Effects people like know Unreal's the future or know it's going to be a tool they're going to yeah. use in the future, but they might be wondering, where do I start? Like, do you have any, any recommendations on some online tutorials? Yeah, definitely. So I want to say that I'm pretty much oh, the only was, one doing was, this right now. That was a, that was a softball, <laughs> so, my friend. <laughs> yeah, that, like, yeah, no, I, I love it. So it's been, um, try to stay humble about it. But I mean, this type of stuff, it just, I like tinkering with this stuff. And so anytime I discover anything, I immediately throw it up on my YouTube page. So if you go to youtube.com slash Jonathan Winbush, I have a whole plethora of different tutorials on there. And then I'm also wrapping up an actual training series that will help you get from A to Z. It's called Creating the Unreal with Unreal Engine. And it's all geared towards motion graphics artists getting into Unreal. And so hopefully I should be completed with that next month. That's going to be distributed through MoGraph.com. So I'm excited to get that out and hopefully get everybody prepared for whenever Unreal Engine 5 comes out because that's going to be a monster in itself. So you definitely want to start 
you know, playing around with Unreal now, getting familiar with it because I feel like the leap with Unreal 5 is going to be massive. So you just really want to be prepared to take advantage of that stuff coming out. Yeah, very cool. You're definitely on like the cutting edge of Unreal and and After Effects in terms of training. I, I can't really think of too many other resources besides your YouTube channel. And just to mention, yeah, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead, John. Uh, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I, I was going to actually ask to, you know, ask you, um, you know, I think a, a very buzzworthy kind of area right now is the virtual production with Unreal. And is that anything that you've kind of looked into? You know, we're talking about like, you know, folks like the Mandalorian or Stargate or various uh, studios in LA that are not only in LA, but around the world that are kind of uh, developing these real time uh, virtual production uh, studios. And it seems to me that for people who are in our field, especially people with the uh, cinema skills or motion graphic skills, that this is definitely an area of uh, employment potential, you know, career development potential yeah. in the future. Just, I was curious what your thoughts are on this this part of the business. Yeah, it's definitely something that I've been looking into. Like I did a tutorial on how to use your iPad as a camera inside of Unreal. So that's kind of like yeah. the the, um, the tipping point of getting into this stuff. Like I don't have access to a studio. Like um, I know everybody sees the Mandalorian or even that SIGGRAPH presentation Epic did last year showing the virtual production stuff. Like I don't have access to that because of, you know, COVID and everything's shut down right now. And so what I've been working on is just experimenting with, you know, my iPad and trying to connect that with the uh, Blackmagic Pocket 4K camera that I have here, just to kind of do stuff, you know, like this is what indie people could do if you don't have like a massive budget, but still get familiar with virtual production. So just, you know, time allotting, that's the stuff that I'm going to be um, tinkering with here in the future. And then also, let me pull this over here. So I just literally got this the other day. I don't know if you can see oh, nice. it, but yeah, this is suit. the Rococo uh, mocap suit. So this yeah. is something I'm definitely um, planning to play around with there too, because I feel like um, just doing like virtual avatars and running like virtual characters all in real time is going to be something to play around with as well. So definitely I'm going to be, you know, it, there's not enough hours in the day. Like I posted on Twitter the other day, like I need to move to another planet that has like more of a daylight just because it's like, there's not enough hours to get into all the stuff that I want to dive into, but it's definitely, um, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely coming. It's cool stuff, especially the mocap stuff and what you can do in sequencer and unreal mixing, you know, mixing uh, animations together and stuff like that. I just mentioned the whole aspect of virtual production because people are always asking us at a lot of these events about um, career yeah. development, things like that. And I think the idea personally for me just something to think about for career development not for me personally because i think i'm old but uh for for a, a younger <laughs> kid who might be getting into the industry is especially if you're into visual effects and animation is that virtual production they're going to need artists on set because they're going to be capturing yeah. doing more and more kind of visual effects on set so it's like bringing your skills to the set you might be behind an unreal box with a bunch of artists but they're going to want to see you know changes in real time as with actors and you know everyone on set so I, it's just kind of an interesting thing for everyone to think about yeah and the thing that i tell people once you get into these game engines it's kind of like the the world is at your fingertips so it's like okay you know the system so yeah you could get a job in virtual production but say like you can't get a job at that moment Maybe you could go to a game studio and maybe do like previs there because you know the system. So you're able to navigate, you know, pretty fluently in the system there. Or, you know, there's something else going on. Like someone needs like a, a mobile app or like a VR or AR app. It's kind of like you have your foundation built. So it's just a spider web from there into all the different territories that are at your disposal that you could jump in. So it's kind of like future proofing yourself. Like, you know, like when I first started out, it's like I was focused on after fix uh, motion graphics and that's it but it's like nowadays it's kind of like people can take like their skill sets and just really extend their arms out and get into like a whole bunch of different pots around them yeah it's very interesting that the uh the the, the uh, programs used and the the talent or you know skill set it goes across goes across many different areas it's not just like a you know a feature film track game track motion design track anymore it's really really uh yeah all all merged together yeah it's so cool that you've yeah. uh, shared 
stuff with us today. I think I think that people yeah. are really excited to, to see this presentation. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, we could go on all day about this. And so I know there's a lot of stuff that people might have questions about. So definitely ask me the questions. And later on this week, I'm also, I'm going to try to put together like more of a package tutorial on the steps going through here, just so people could really see like my thought process, especially with the Sapphire plugins, like how I went in, made my choices, the type of attributes that I, you know, dialed in to get exactly where I want it. Like this is just a brief overview, but there's so much more that I can show. So I'm going to put together a proper tutorial for you guys and, Hopefully, you know, people get a lot of knowledge out of there. So, you know, just ask me the questions that you need if I, like ahead of time and I'll try to put that into a tutorial for you guys. It's Very awesome. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much for uh, sharing your, yeah. uh, you know, all, all your you. work with the, uh, with the industry. Yeah. I mean, I learned uh, a lot personally. <laughs> so, like, uh, I need a tutorial on this. Uh, well, let's let's give away um, and announce our winner. Um, the winner of the Boris Effect Suite is uh, Rhea Borzak from Magnetic Dreams. Congratulations, Rhea. Uh, Rhea wins a 12-month subscription to Everything We Make, Sapphire Continuum, Mocha, Silhouette, um, uh, and Optics. So congratulations, Rhea from Manic Dreams. Thank you, Jonathan. That was an amazing presentation. Um, really fun to watch. And like I said, I even personally, I got a ton out of it. So thank you very much. No, I appreciate you guys having me on. And yeah, next time we got to get together at a convention or something, lunch on me. I don't drink, so yeah. I'll, I'll do lunch or something. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, very can't cool. Wait to see All right. Again. Yeah, I can't wait too. Um, we will be back in a half an hour with Mary Poplin, um, who's going to do an amazing presentation on, she's going to break down Mocha Pro, some of the new features in 2020.5, specifically for a VFX uh, workflow. So come back in 30 minutes for us and check out Mary can Poplin I, with Mocha Pro. So can I give one more shout out? Sure. Please. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to give a big shout out to Ben of B motion. He did the audio design for this piece. I told him I shot him out during the live stream. So yeah, I believe, you know, Ben, he's a Boris effects user as well. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Ben, for doing the sound design behind this. It came out incredible. Yeah. Ben at B motion. Hey Ben, if you're watching, um, everyone should check out Ben's podcast slash live stream. I don't even know what you call it nowadays. It's like the production value in that show is <laughs> through the roof. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so definitely, is it, is it called? Is it called in the industry? Is that what his um his live stream um, is called? In the biz. In the biz. Yeah, yeah in I know the biz. biz. So yep. Yeah. So yeah, everyone check out uh, Ben at B Motion on YouTube for his in the biz. Um, live stream. Very cool stuff. All right, my friend. Thank you, Jonathan. That was amazing. Um, thank, thank you, you, everyone, for watching. We will be back in a half an hour with Mocha Pro for VFX and Mary Poplin. So we'll see everybody in 30 minutes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>